Hey guys, today I'm going to be doing three historical fiction book reviews. The first being Elizabeth I by Margaret George, The Accidental Empress by Alison Pataki, and Rain the Prophecy by Lily Blake. Elizabeth I by Margaret George is a historical fiction account of the later years of Queen Elizabeth I's reign, starting in 1588 and ending in 1603. It's also a story about the rivalry between Elizabeth and her cousin, Latisse Knowles, and the family drama they have to deal with when Latisse's son, the Earl of Essex, begins to undermine the authority of his queen. Yet again, another masterpiece by Margaret George. Uh, the, the only other book that I have read by her was her historical fiction account of Helen of Troy, and that was really good. This book about Elizabeth I is really good as well. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And the thing you have to know about this book, uh, this is the later years of Queen Elizabeth I's reign. Uh, and I just found this so fascinating and interesting because I tend to read a lot of historical fiction showcasing the early life of Elizabeth I, you know, when she's a young woman. Um, you know, a lot of times dealing with her relationship with either her sister Queen Mary or dealing with her relationship with all of that drama involving Robert Dudley. So it was honestly quite refreshing to read a book about an Elizabeth I who is no longer in her prime. She is a old woman in this book and it was just utterly fascinating and captivating. And also just everything that was being dealt with in this book, you know, dealing with the Spanish Armada and also dealing with everything going on with the Earl of Essex and all of his drama. <laughs> and I just appreciated that this book did focus on Elizabeth as an aging monarch because what Margaret George does do with this book, uh, Elizabeth is the virgin queen. She is literally the virgin queen because you know a lot of historical fiction tends to like to to talk about the, the the what ifs, you know, was Elizabeth really the Virgin Queen? But in this, she is really the Virgin Queen. <laughs> so Elizabeth, she has absolutely no heirs, as we know from history. And this book is just dealing a lot about that, about the fact that she is, she is aging, she has no successor, and she keeps putting that off. She won't tell her advisors who she plans on having succeed her because she feels like if she announces who will reign after her she feels like she will be forgotten and quickly pushed to the side while everyone else cheers for the the younger person waiting for her to die. So this book definitely deals with Elizabeth who has a lot of insecurities. She's facing her own mortality and her impending death and it's something that really frightens her. She's really afraid of death throughout this book. She's often really paranoid about it. So of course with Elizabeth being in her old age she has to deal with how others are viewing her because she's going through menopause, she's going through all the issues of losing her sight, and she also has to deal with her fading memory. She's no longer the young girl that she used to be so she's constantly worried about her memory especially because people thinking that maybe she's fragile and she's she's going insane and crazy and that they need someone to usurp her, someone younger and stronger. So she's constantly worried about that threat and fear of someone taking her place. And this book deals with a lot. It covers a lot. The first half of the book covers the Spanish Armada and all of that. And the second half of the book focuses on the Earl of Essex, who is the son of her cousin Latisse Knowles, who in the past, uh, Latisse and Elizabeth have had a lot of issues and rivalry between them, especially in regards to their shared love of Robert Dudley. And the other thing that I enjoyed about this book, uh, everything with the Earl of Essex was quite foreign to me, you guys. I'm not gonna lie. It's like I know so much about the the beginning reign 
of Elizabeth I, you know, the first half of her life. But I'm not really that familiar with the second half of her life. And the Earl of Essex, this was a lot of new information for me, and I didn't know I didn't know what the outcome was going to be. There was there were so many twists and turns, and I just didn't know what to expect and what was going to happen. And I love that dynamic between Elizabeth and the Earl of Essex, because the Earl of Essex, he has such a big ego. And on top of that, he also loves Elizabeth, but he, he loves himself more. And he takes it upon himself to try and earn her favor, but at the same time, he also sits and goes off and does things that his queen has not ordered him to do. So, of course, that gets him in a lot of hot water. And I also liked that we got to experience the point of view of Latisse Knowles herself, Elizabeth's cousin. Uh, Latisse has been banished from court, but she's also just as captivating as Elizabeth. And the one thing that Latisse and Elizabeth share, they share this same role in a way that they're both women in a male-dominated society and they constantly have to prove themselves to the men that do surround them. And Latisse and Elizabeth are both incredibly intelligent, they are incredibly resourceful, and the other thing that I liked about this book, it was a who's who of Elizabethan England. There were so many cameo appearances. It's like some characters, some of these historical figures, they did have a bit longer page time, but there were some that had very, very minor roles, cameos, literally. You have some of the famous explorers of the time show up, like Drake and Raleigh. And then also some of the famous playwrights and writers of the time, like Shakespeare and Spencer. Even John Dee makes his appearance in interesting ways. And I think one of my favorite cameo appearances was by Guy Fox. <laughs> Uh, he popped up and I was like, whoa, that is interesting. <laughs> but yeah, I think Guy Fawkes definitely had the best little minor role in here. So overall, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. It is a huge clunky book, yeah guys. And yeah, not every moment of it is, is great. Uh, there are a lot of moments where the pacing can be a little wonky. Uh, sometimes events move really quickly. Other times things just seem really slow monotonous and boring but for the most part I do think this was a very very incredibly well done book you know focusing on the latter half of Queen Elizabeth her reign so if you want to try something new with Queen Elizabeth I highly recommend this book I think it will be well worth the read and like me you know there were so many new things that I got to learn which was nice so let's move on to the next book the Accidental Empress by Alison Pataki tells the story of 15-year-old Elizabeth, or Cece as she is more commonly known, Duchess of Bavaria, who travels to Austria with the intention of helping her older sister marry Emperor Franz Joseph. But her sister is not keen on the idea of marriage, and Cece finds herself stealing the attention and affection of the young emperor. Thrust onto the throne of Europe's most treacherous imperial court, Cece upsets political and familial loyalties in her quest to win and keep the love of Franz Joseph and her people. Earlier in the year, I read and reviewed the second book in this series, Cece, Empress on Her Own. Uh, at the time, when I read that book, I had no idea that it was part of a duology. So it's kind of strange that I've already read and reviewed the second book, and I'm just now getting around to the first book. So hopefully this makes sense. <laughs> uh, I guess that's the great thing about this duology. Uh, you can either read bo both books or just one book. You don't really have to read them in order, weirdly enough, because I was never lost or confused with my my reversal there. <laughs> but yeah, I finally did get around to The Accidental Empress. I love this book just as much as I loved the second book. Uh, CC continued to just be a, an incredibly fascinating woman. Uh, the, the second book in the series focused on the second half of CC's life, where she's already a grown woman, and that leads up to her when she's like in her 50s or 60s, somewhere in there. So uh, this first book deals with Cece as a young girl, uh, leading into her teenage years, uh, and then yeah, leading to her marriage with Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria-Hungary. And yeah, just such a fantastic 
premise with this. And yeah, as the title says, the accidental empress. Cece became, in a way, an accidental empress because her sister was originally meant for the emperor. But her sister, her sister was just really shy and timid and she just really wanted nothing to do with Emperor Franz Joseph. But Cece being kind of the life of any party, being more outspoken and brave, she ends up getting the attention of the Emperor. So what we have with this book, uh, Cece has this really fairy tale image of the life of being an Empress. But once she does become an Empress, the honeymoon phase is quickly over. Uh, she starts popping out children and she quickly finds out that her mother-in-law is one hell of a powerful lady. Cece essentially has no say in her life in this book. Uh, she has no control over her own children. It's her mother-in-law who controls everything. So yeah, I mean, I really don't have too much more to say about this book because I think I pretty much said everything I wanted to say in my review of the second book in the series. So if you want to kind of hear more of my opinions, I definitely recommend checking that book review out. But yeah, I definitely enjoyed this first book. Uh, continued to love Cece as much as I loved her in that second book. God, it's, it's so strange, you guys. I can't believe how I read the books. <laughs> the second one, then the first one. It's just so weird. And I gotta say, Alison Pataki, I think she's quickly becoming one of my new favorite historical fiction writers. I've only read two books by her, but I'm just so impressed with her, her writing skills and her amount of research. Just, yeah, just such fantastic, incredible writing from her, and I definitely can't wait to pick up more by her. In The Prophecy by Lily Blake, the plague is raging outside the gates of the French court. Mary, Queen of Scots, is safe inside, but she worries for her husband, Francis, who has taken off to help their friend, Lola. When Nostradamus receives a vision of Mary's possible death, Mary has to worry about the vision coming true and tries everything in her power to stop it from coming true. So before I do talk about this book, uh, this is a book tie-in to the TV series Rain. And I'm not going to talk about any spoilers in regards to the TV show. I'm just giving you that little bit of warning. I'm not going to talk about any spoilers from that. I'm not going to talk about any spoilers from this. I'm going to be as general as I can. Overall, I did give this book two stars. I was really disappointed with this. Uh, as cheesy and as inaccurate as the TV show is, you know, following the life of a young Mary Queen of Scots, I still really like the series. It's it's fun in its own way, despite being cheesy and massively in, inaccurate. But I was really looking forward to reading this book, knowing that it takes place in between uh, the season one finale to the start of the season two premiere. And I gotta say, I was just so disappointed with this book. There was nothing new about this book. The, even the plot itself, the plot was just redundant and it gave me nothing new. It gave me nothing new with the characters. This It was kind of boring in a way, unfortunately. Because that's the unfortunate thing about book tie-ins to shows. Because you can't sit and add too much. You know what I mean? You can't sit and add something because whatever you add, it's not going to be canon on the show, if that makes sense. So really, I only recommend this book if you are a diehard fan of the show, but I am going to say it right now, I think you are going to be disappointed with this because you're not really going to get anything great in this book. But I do got to give a lot of praise to Lily Blake, the writer. I think she did a phenomenal job of capturing the characters as they are presented on the show. I think she did a good job of capturing their voices and their mannerisms. And yeah, I mean, she clearly knew and watched the show and yet yeah, all of the stuff that is mentioned in season one, that is, it's all mentioned here in this book. So, so yeah, you're, if you've seen season one, you shouldn't be too terribly confused going into this book. And I gotta say, the most interesting thing that even happens in this book, Nostradamus, 
uh, he receives a prophecy of Mary's upcoming death and he tells this to her and she spends the whole novel trying to prevent this vision of Nostradamus's and that's kind of the one frustrating thing about this book it's a sense of false drama if you will because you know that there's another season after this book you know that Mary's not going to die in between seasons so that's why I say false drama because it's really frustrating but I also did like the whole notion of you know the plague outside the gates of the French courts because you definitely got to have a good idea what's going on outside the palace gates because here's all of the nobles you know behind the gates living their life of luxury they have all of their food and they don't have to worry about the plague so I kind of liked that idea in the book as well so yeah I think what I'm essentially saying I think this book was a waste of time in a way a waste of ink and paper not necessary by any means so yeah you guys that's it for these three books in the comments below have you guys read any of these books do you want to read any of them just let me know so that's it for this review. I hope you guys enjoyed. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you like this video, you may like these other videos. Bye guys.